So obviously you've been working a long time on fighting against the fact that the UK is basically run by Stonewall's diversity and inclusion enforcers. Like our streets are entirely policed by the Rainbow Brigade. You've had your own run-ins, as we spoke about in the, in the prior segment, um, which will be available on YouTube as well. But I thought we'd go through some exact examples from the likes of Fair Cop um, as to how this is taking place in practice. I'd like to say for anyone who's watching, if you'd like to see the genealogy of the identity, the progressive stack, as you called it, the hierarchy of who can get away with what, you can go over to the website, sign up and watch Carl and Callum go through the intersectionality uh, origins and intentions from one Kimberly Crenshaw, the original little Marxist thought camp that they had to germinate things like critical race theory out of the academic ether. And now we're all suffering because of that. So pay a fiver a month and you can get educated and... and talk to everyone else about it. Um, if we go on to this first tweet, uh, we can see it's been deleted. <laughs> and I was like, hmm, I remember seeing this earlier. So I remember looking through the, the script and thinking, oh, what, what, what tweet was that? And then I went to Fair Cop. And funnily enough, you guys had, had archived it and brought it up. We can go to the next one, please, John. Um, it was the Devon and Cornwall Police talking about hate crime awareness week. And saying that, oh, we have a zero tolerance to hate crime. And hate crime basically means um, naughty words and graffiti that might be perceived as offensive. Yeah. So can you can you walk yeah. us through you what say, exactly uh, happened uh, here? Hate crime cannot be any criminal or non-criminal act. Yeah. It can't be. That's uh, You can't have a crime that is not a crime. Yeah. This is, unless it's Schrodinger's crime. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But depending on who's, depending on who's, who's looking, looking at, it, yeah. at, at, at the time. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, nuts. It, on every level, the tweet is is written by somebody who has exchanged critical understanding for mantras and meaningless dogma. They've heard this in a course. Mm. They they they've seen this on a meme. Yeah. Somebody said this to them, and they thought, "Oh, that sounds good. A hate crime could be anything that's criminal or non-criminal. That covers it all, doesn't it? Yeah, it does cover it all. But your job is to prevent crime. Your job is to solve crime. Your job is to crack, catch criminals. It's not to go out and police things which are non-crime. Yep. And I'll say, I've said it before, and I will say it again: hate is as n the police have no business policing hate, mm. except where that hate is on the cusp of spilling over into criminal action. Mm. Then, of course then, of course, the police should be involved. But hate in and of itself is an everyday human emotion. I'm sick to the back teeth of saying it. There is nothing wrong with hate in and of itself. Mm. You know what? It's not even one of the seven deadly sins. No, no, you're right. No. Avarice is, greed is, lust is, envy, envy is. Yeah. Hate isn't. No. No, well, I, 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 someone, I think it might have been... Um... Stefan Molyneux, of all people, who said anger is the immune system for our soul. And it's incredibly natural to despise or be disgusted by something because it's an evolutionary advantage to keep us away from things we think might be dangerous. Yeah, so, sure, some hatreds might be completely arbitrary based on wrong presuppositions. If you hate someone based on, you know, how dark their skin is rather than the content of their character, yeah, it's completely stupid. But some hatreds are completely legitimate. For example, the entire police system operates on a, on a system of intolerance of hatred towards criminal acts. And the reason they aren't solving any bloody crimes is because they've stopped doing that. Yeah, Instead, not, they're being intolerant towards the general public who don't line up with the newest progressive orthodoxy rolled out in their training sessions. But also, hate. Mm. I think if you if you ever read Stephen Pinker, The Angels yes. of Our Better Nature, it's an, it's an incredible book, a very optimistic book, and I like optimism. He actually talks about how the fact that, you know, beating the living daylights out of each other is our natural state. Mm. That's our first nature. Our first nature is antagonism and mistrust and bigotry. That is our first nature. Mm. It's our second nature, which moves on to trust and kindness and accepting people, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. It's the, the, the natural state is to not trust. What do we tell our kids? Don't talk to strangers. Yes. That is, that is asking them to to use bigotry and prejudice hmm. as a form of protection. Yeah. And it's only when you it's only when you graduate out of childhood and uh, uh, come come to the position where you were able to fend for yourself and fight for yourself hmm. that you then you then take away that bigotry, you know, be um don't talk to strangers to yeah. let's accept all strangers. Hmm. That's our second nature. It's not our first nature. Yeah. And I tell you what, hatred you just need to go to a football match. Hmm. Hatred is manifest. Yeah. 
every single week in every single football crowd across the country. Yeah. You hate somebody for that 90 minutes and maybe an hour before the match and maybe an hour after the match yeah. on the basis of the shirt they're wearing. Yeah, and some of the funniest football chants come out of that. I remember when um, the Sweden-England match happened at the last World Cup and uh, the chant was, and it, I'm going to butcher the rhyming here because we're trying to swear, but your excrement, but your birds are fit. And it's like, well, that could be racist against Swedes. Yeah. But it was hilariously <laughs> complimentary because it spoke about how rubbish they were at football, but the fact that their women were quite attractive. So, And, and, and also, yeah, the, 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 my, my favourite is um, <laughs> is, is, is uh, to Luis Suarez, who was well-known for biting people, you know, um, your teeth are offside. Yeah. yeah. Which I think is just yeah. is, is, yeah, is, is hilarious. Offside, is, yeah. But we, we live in – hate is natural. What yeah. we need to do is control – our hate mm. and civilize our hate. The reason that the speaker in the House of Commons is always shouting order, order yes. is because there is a tendency to disorder. Yes. There is a tendency for the antagonism, which is natural and right within the House of Commons to spill over mm. into something that's not right. And that's why the speaker shouts order, order. Yes. Hate antagonism, ill will, ill feeling, dislike, these are natural. When Angela Rayner mm. calls Tories scum, yeah. actually, that's normal. We, we, we all know um, lefties who yeah. think we're scum. Yeah, it might be all of unbecoming us. of the position, but it's, unbecoming it's the not position. shocking that she believes it. No, yeah. and we don't think that just because she said it yeah. that she's going to go out and take an Uzi and you know shoot up the the the, the Tory Women's Institute or something like no, that. No, that's after Labour win the next election. Obviously. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> joke and the, everyone. And the, the same thing with 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 the, with the woman on question time was it the Jeremy Vine show the other day. Oh, where, the, where she mentioned that um, that uh, Tories should not Tor be resuscitated. Shouldn't be resuscitated. Yeah. Look, sorry, but I have I would have no problem whatsoever if she was the nurse, if I needed resource tasting and she was this. Because you know what? I don't believe that she actually meant it. I think it was rhetorical speech said in the moment. I, I, I wouldn't trust her. I don't think she's Harold Shipman. I can understand why they said that we don't want her on a death ward because if she's capable of that. But you're right. It's probably overblown. I'm, I'm kind of happy that she's not working around patients in future. But... I think it probably was off, and also an off-the-cuff remark that she, she sincerely probably regrets. Because even then, she tried kind of backpedalling it on the show. Yeah, we all of us say things that we don't mean. Yeah. We, we've, we, we've, we've ended up in this world where everything we say, which is actually just hyperbole, it's just rhetoric, mm. it's just heat-of-the-moment stuff, somehow we take it literally as though, oh my goodness, they've said this, that means I can't possibly be safe around them. Rubbish. Yep. It's rhetorical speech. That's all it is. Yeah. So if we can just go on to the next one, please, John. Um, so you were, the Fair Cop were looking a little at the police uh, organisation which was affiliated with, with this group. Um, it's quite interesting. It says the Community Safety Accreditation Scheme, and this is one of these ideological rubber stamps that you were talking about, basically giving out training courses and saying, oh, okay, we'll give you a little badge if you're ideologically aligned. And it seems like a lot of these disciplinary committees that are, should be relatively toothless have actually captured our institutions and are making them abide by a set of rules which nobody voted for, the government didn't pass laws on, etc. And it seems like Devon and Cornwall Police have been operating by this scheme since about 2005, as you can see in this tweet thread. And it's resulted in things like this. John, if you can play this insane video. So, just, just as audio listeners can understand this is a, a club called the salad bar and there are animated fruit and vegetables standing outside and a tomato has handed its id card over to what looks like a courgette and a bit of broccoli that's minding the door they're mocking him and i think the joke is meant to be that tomatoes are often mistaken as as vegetables when they're fruit so they can't quite understand the identity of the tomato the tomato then enters the club where a bunch of fruit and veg are dancing and he can't decide which bathroom to use, even though he's obviously a vegetable, because he might, uh, fruit roll, because he might identify as a vegetable. The depressed tomato then leaves, because there isn't a bathroom for him, walks down the street, and then down an alleyway, he encounters someone spray painting on a wall, um, tomatoes ain't no fruit, with an X on it, it's a lemon. So, a vegetable and fruit purist, I suppose. And the depressed tomato slumps down against the wall, and then puts his hand up and decides, has a bright idea, to call the police, who You're has a suspiciously German moustache and a pride hat on, when it happens. to report you hate crime. Stop it happening to someone else. But Don't let other people's actions dictate who you are. And then this weird Mr. Men looking character jabs his finger 
in the camera, just like the copper did at me, and says, don't let other people's perceptions dictate who you are. Like, it's a bit of fruit doing a, doing a career. But that was actually made by the police department that Fair Cop pulled up. But it, it's beyond belief. They're not only treating people like children. They're putting actual public money into making animations, telling you to report naughty words or the fact that you can't get a bathroom. It's infantilizing. Yeah. That's what it is. It's absolutely infantilizing. Yeah. If you can't... There is no such thing as an oppressed tomato. Let's no. just let's just put that right out there. Okay, tomatoes don't have a history uh, of being oppressed across the ages and across every society. I don't know. We're, I've been I've been made fun of when I've been sunburned. So, <laughs> women do have mm. a history of being oppressed throughout the ages and across continents, mm. and you cannot begin to to solve a problem unless you can name it. Mm. Okay, so. What they're trying to do is saying that uh, by, by, by having the oppressed tomato, they're downplaying the oppression of women, the actual oppression of groups which historically have been and continue to be oppressed by other groups. Yeah. It's, it's infantilizing and it's stupid because you cannot begin to solve a problem unless you can name the problem. Yeah. And the name of the problem here is sexism by men towards women who dress as women to get access to their spaces often because they're also gynophiliacs it's not abiding by the feminist conception of patriarch as this timeless ephemeral global conspiracy between all men to keep women down it's some weird creepy men specifically weak men will use the trans issue to dress up gain access to women's spaces and sexually exploit them and young girls and we're trying to defend women from that but instead police officers and departments are using public funds to create infantile cartoons about fruit and veg self-identification to push you reporting more trans hate crimes that aren't actually happening. It's mental. Like, I, I don't see how we got there. So Fair Cop called this out, and then um, turns out they've been blocking loads of people, including Fair Cop. So ain't yeah. that lovely? Yeah, well, I, again, this is, this is quite serious. This habit of blocking dissenting voices is very serious. It's actually incredibly serious, and it's a breach of human rights. Yeah. Because Article 10 of the ECHR talks about authority not restricting the giving and the receiving of information. Yeah. So when a police force or a police department block an individual or a, hum a very successful human rights organization yeah. who came to fame by beating the police on Article 10 mm. ECHR, when they block us, they are then committing another Article 10 breach, and we will be holding them to account. Because yeah. it's not just Devon and Cornwall. It's Hampshire. It's Leicester. It's West Yorkshire. There's a whole bunch of police forces or police departments who are blocking anybody that criticises them. Yeah, they're trying to insulate themselves from totally fair scrutiny from their complete misconduct and favouring one identity group over another, despite the demonstrable crimes of a minority of people within that identity group that don't represent the group, but still must be spoken about in order to protect women from men, again, who exploit the group's identity marker in order to abuse them. And yeah, absolutely. But I I'm saying, no, you know, if you're a chief constable or a PCC, if you've got a department that is blocking yeah. blocking Fair Cop and or the Bad Law the Project or members of the public without very, very good reason, we will come for you. Yeah. We will come for you. We will drag you through the court because this is a human rights breach. Mm. Don't blame you at all. If we can go on to the next one, John. Um, we can just see this is everywhere. So this is something that Pete in the office forwarded to me because he noticed this. If we can just scroll through some of the photos. I apologise, John, for all his uh, notifications. If we can just scroll down. Um, there's like that one in the middle there, for example. The uh, that, Up a bit, John. That one, perfect. Yes, I'm just going to describe to our audio listeners. Um, it's talking about how we've got loads more diverse and inclusive officers, but... This is something I noticed, and it's something I noticed with the, the police officers who were accosting me outside Tory party conference. The officer who was talking to me was, um, I don't wish to be rude, but he wasn't in any shape to chase down a athletic young criminal, and he was significantly shorter than me, which I know some men are, some men are taller. I know Harry intimidates me every time I walk through the office. But this group <laughs> of officers is majority young, short women, um, and black and Asian officers who cares about skin colour, except actually the Met Police keep putting adverts on Spotify saying, um, we need you to police your community. And it's like, right, okay, let's not segregate police officers by skin colour, please. But it's like, do we not... Have, uh, you'll probably know more about this. Have the height, weight, physicality standards been lowered, abolished even, for frontline coppers who might have to chase down dangerous criminals wielding machetes on London streets, for example? So so the, the height restriction went uh, along time ago. Yeah. And I've got to say, in defence of 
in de defense of small police officers, female mm. police officers, um, uh, I have a stepdaughter who is uh, uh, short and a police officer. But as Shakespeare said, she may be short, but she's fierce. Okay. Very, very, very fierce. Well, I think there's definitely... Well, I, think, uh, I think what, what worries me war more yeah. is the, um, the fitness yes. issue. Now, one might hope that a fatty in the police force is allowed to remain in the police force because they know an awful... They've got vast amounts of experience yeah. about the law. Okay, they've got vast amounts of... Uh, clearly, that guy yeah. didn't Did have not. any. No. Not at all. So I, I don't understand. Yeah. Um, I was going to say as well, we were speaking about this in the office when we saw these photos, and we said there are definitely places in the police force for female officers, particularly for the like job that no one wants to do, which is knocking at people's doors and telling them about tragic accidents. You know, I, I had that in 2008 when my uncle committed suicide, and mm. we had a female and male police officer come to the door, and they spoke to my mum and dad, and I know, you know, that can that can never be something that isn't tragic but they did a, a very good job of delivering that news at the time so there's definitely a place for frontline female police officers it's just i wouldn't want someone that you know short fine i have quibbles with that but the physical fitness requirement and also i wouldn't want to put a bunch of female police officers against a muscular man wielding a machete on london streets which we've seen time and time again it's like the leicester square stabbing that happened a little while ago he stabbed a female police officer during that altercation it's like what why are we putting these police officers in danger and why are we putting the general public in danger by not being able to apprehend criminals just for inclusion it's utterly utterly frustrating so if we can go to the uh, the next one why is all this stuff happening and faircop had pointed this out it's because one of the consultant charities is victim support Right, And if you can scroll down, please, John, so we can read their, their definition of hate crime. Hate crime is the term used to describe an incident or crime against someone based on a part of their identity. There are five categories of identity when a person is targeted because of a hostility or prejudice towards their disability, race or ethnicity, religion or belief, which includes non-belief, so atheist hate crimes, sexual orientation, or gender identity. Victim support also recognises crimes targeted at alternative subcultures, such as goth, as a form of hate crime. I would then assume that's why Coronation Street had a recent... Um, storyline about a goth and his girlfriend being attacked and one guy died and the other girl had a had a goth hate crime committed against her and oh god wasn't it awful hate crime can be any criminal or non-criminal act as you said doesn't make any sense such as graffiti vandalism to property name calling assault or online abuse using social media experiencing hate crime can be a particularly frightening experience as as you've been targeted because of who you are or who or what your attacker thinks you are unlike non-identity related offenses the attack is very personal specifically targeted which means it's less likely to be a random attack okay but we don't put lovers quarrels under hate crime and that's definitely to do with hate so again none of this makes sense but faircott pointed out hmm, this actually seems to be one of the sources where they're getting their definition from this nebulous definition because we go on to the next one as we know police of vice and virtue get lots from stonewall Ugh, we hate cookies pop-ups um if we go just scroll down victim support uk's most lgbt friendly charity according to the stonewall index <laughs> Isn't that just amazing? I wonder how this weird definition of hate crime con came to contaminate the, the uh, English and the, the whole the whole notion of hate crime. Though it it sort of presupposes that the, the such thing as a noble crime. Yeah, like there can be noble graffiti yep. or noble theft yep. or somebody steals my watch because they love me so much. Yeah, I mean, it's just it's it's an, it's nonsensical. It makes no it makes no sense. And what we've done. We, yet again, we've watered down something which was very serious. Mm. The Holocaust was serious. Yeah. It wasn't about oppressed tomatoes. No. The murder of Stephen Lawrence was serious. It wasn't... Well, the thing about Stephen Lawrence is quite interesting, actually, because the McPherson report, which addressed the murder of Stephen Lawrence, the major criticism was towards the attitude of the Met police. Mm. Now, what's interesting is the Met police have applied the lessons of the McPherson report to everybody except themselves. Right. Because if you, I did a, a recent FOI, how many non-crime hate incidents have been applied to Met police officers since 2014? Mm. The answer came back zero. Right. Zero. So they are applying non-crime hate incidents to everybody except themselves. Who watches the watchman? That's exactly it. They mm. are giving themselves a huge, great pass. Yes. Uh, so if we can just go on to the next one, I thought this was quite interesting because you forwarded me this by, by Helen Dale. Yeah. And the reason they're giving themselves this pass and, and blowing things out of proportion is because they've got this concept 
of the uh, Allport scale, and you already explained it in the previous segment, but just to go slightly through it, um, and Helen does say that all psychology is one of the, the dud social sciences. I know our resident psychologist there, Josh, will be very frustrated by hearing that, but Allport's core claim is that each step in the pyramid, and she shows the pyramid, if you don't mind scrolling down, John, just for our video viewers, has a causal relationship with the step above it. That is, anti uh, antilocution, often translated as hate speech, which he was accusing me of, although Allport himself did not use the later term, later uh, leads naturally to the exclusion of um, no black people, no Jews, no Irish, no dog signs, which were put up in the 1960s, for example, which my, my grandma was subject to as an Irish immigrant, um, or no lady members sort, which in turn becomes something like Jim Crow, which then turns into Kristallnacht or Stalin's anti-Kulak purges and culminates in the Holocaust or Holodomor. Obviously, they wouldn't mention the Holodomor because that was perpetrated by communists and they wouldn't want to make them look bad. So this, as you already said um, in the previous segment, is what they're basing their ideas on. And it my my frustration with this is is twofold, right? It first of all revo revokes the agency of people because it erases the moral boundaries between actual genocidal maniacs and people who tell jokes or have reasonable criticism, but maybe don't even word it that that articulately, or uh, like me, say one word and it's taken out of context, and that's not even a bad word. And also, it also morally exculpates the worst kind of criminals because it believes that if you can just reprogram them mentally to not think the initial thought then one, they, they shouldn't have been guilty in the first place. It's the society, the, the intolerant society which caused them to commit the crime. And if you can intervene before crimes are done with sort of brainwashing sessions like the police are subjected to in their training um, groups, then that will stop all crime. We can get to this perfect utopian offence-free society. It makes no sense. Yeah, the, the, the other thing, of course, is that we asked the College of Policing, who they're the ones who who issued the, the, the hate crime guidance and yeah. the non-crime hate incidents, et cetera. And specifically, they say they do this in order to prevent an escalation up, up the all port scale. Right. We asked them, when they reissued the guidance in 2020, so they've had six years uh, 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 of this, what research did they do to mm. see how effective it, it had been? And the answer came back, they hadn't done any research, oh, none whatsoever. So even if they believed this were, were, were true, if they believed that this was real, you would expect a professional organization to test the theory, to mm. see how effective it was. They haven't done, and the reason they haven't done it is because they found an entirely different um, reason for having non-crime hate incidents. Mm. Okay, and that is to generate a chilling effect on free speech. Absolutely. It's got nothing to do with escalation to crime. That's the lie upon which the policy is predicated on, okay? It's actually there in order to encourage police officers to record non-crime hate incidents, to approach you at the Tory party conference over the single word insidious, to approach um, Darren Brady in Aldershot over a meme, to approach me based on the fact that I retweeted somebody else's feminist dog rule, on the belief in the mind of the police officer that by approaching us, they were preventing a genocide. Mm. It's insane. But what it actually is, it's to do with categorizing the wrong type of the, the people with the wrong type of politics which is you and i mm. it's to do with putting a black mark against our character mm. that's what it's to do with it's got nothing to do with preventing crime yeah it's a scarlet letter i, I wonder as well if anyone's introduced them to the brandenburg test that was formulated in america which was like the line of what crossover from free speech to incitement to violence, because if that was a policy, that would pretty much fix all of this. But I don't suppose anyone at the Home Office has put this into law, unfortunately. If we go on to the next one, please, John, this is something you also brought to my attention. Um, Conservative Home have done some reporting very recently on how the police have been using identity politics, and that's just allowed loads of other uh, crimes, actual crimes, not non-crime hate incidents, to go not only unreported, but unsolved. My girlfriend, for example, had her luggage stolen on the train. They had CCTV footage of the perpetrator. They simply gave her a crime report number and said, we're not going to follow it up, even though it had all your belongings in there. And that was about a year ago. Ridiculous. So apparently the Home Office figures indicate declining po police performance on bread and butter issues. Only 3.7% of burglaries, 4.2% of thefts, and 6.6% of robberies result in a charge. In 2010 to 2011, 15% of these crimes recorded by police resulted in a charge or summons. So that's dropped by roughly 6%. There's something amiss when thefts, burglaries, and robberies go unpunished. But non-crime figures increase year on year. Comes as little surprise then that Suella Braverman, new Home Secretary, wrote to police chiefs encouraging them to spend less time on diversity and focus in, and focus instead on tackling crime. Um, a brief aside, do you think that's going to go anywhere? 
Well, I don't know, because the blob always gets in the way, doesn't it, yeah. unfortunately? Yeah, the civil service just yeah. paralyse anything. Indeed, political activists are influencing policing priorities from within, and the implications are significant, not least because they threaten the police's sworn commitment to neutrality by drawing them into political disputes. One area of contention is non-crime hate incidents. Data obtained by a Freedom of Information request while researching a recent report for Civitas we called We Need to Check Your Thinking shows non-crime hate incident figures have dramatically increased over five years. Um, non-crime hate incidents, as you already said, are not criminal offences, but do show up on background checks. Research found that just seven police forces recorded almost 27,000 non-crime hate incidents over five years, with the Metropolitan Police alone, thanks Cressida Dick, you useless person, accounting for 10,961 of them. The percentage increase when comparing 2017 figures to 2021 figures was a staggering 129% increase. Note that the Met, which was placed under special measures, found by was found by an independent investigation to be failing to record 69,000 actual crimes every year, as well as almost no cases of antisocial behaviour. And I can say that from my area in South East London. We're on the outskirts. We're not a... But we don't even have a tube line. You know, it's not that antisocial. But there's been massive reports of it as reported by our local politicians in the council elections and that people just leave in, you know, graffiti and smashing up cars, throwing little bits of um, like the balloons that people take in the road, good rubbish everywhere. Not being done about it, but oh God, you say the word insidious, <laughs> clap you in cuffs. Figures show that police spent at least £58,000 on Stonewall products last year. That would explain it, wouldn't it? Down from 83000 in 2018. Oh, they're saving us so many thousands. Over seven years, the police spent almost half a million pounds on Stonewall products, an average of 67000 per year. Stonewall promotes highly contentious ideas. Despite this, the group has written police pro policy on transgenderism. It's as you've said in your repeated tweets and in your court cases, Stonewall are basically running the police and they're making them an ideological uh, enforcement arm of their, of, of their doctrine. That, 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 that's exactly it. it it's... Um, you, you, uh, I know these figures. I've seen these figures. When I see them, I'm shocked every time I see them. Mm. Twenty-seven thousand non-crime hate incidents in just with just ten forces. Yeah, that's huge. Yeah. That's absolutely huge. That's that's potentially twenty-seven thousand people mm. with black marks against their character. Twenty-seven thousand mm. people who are who may or may not have their career advancement or change inhibited because because of this. Yeah. That is terrifying. That's why I think Mr. Justice Knowles, when he likened the actions of Humberside mm. to the Stasi, the Cheka, and the Gestapo, he wasn't using hyperbole. Mm. He saw the direction of trouble. And unfortunately, the police have done nothing to suggest that his assessment was wrong. It, the, the problem is getting worse, not better. When we win, and when I win, they double down. So this then becomes a, a war of attrition. Mm. It becomes a, a, a battle of wills. Now, the thing is, we will keep going. Yeah. The Bad Law Project and Fair Cop will keep going. Mm. We will remain a thorn in their side. We will issue pre-action letters. We will hunt down every chief constable who prioritizes ideology and politics over actual crime. We will do that, and we will look to have them removed from office. We will look to have the PCCs removed from office. We will look to have police officers sacked if they do this, because what we want is a police force, a police service, call it what you will, mm. that operates without fear or favour, whose locus of control is the law, not Stonewall, not in so-called independent advisory groups, yeah. not mermaids, not victim support, not the perception of so-called victims, the law. Mm. That's what we want. We want the police to uphold the law. And just That's be it. accountable. That's yeah. it. Just to the people that they're meant to serve. Um, it's also important to note, just almost finally, that they're chasing phantoms entirely. Um, the Home Office figures that were published last Thursday state that hate crimes have apparently risen to... Uh, the highest level on record between March 2021 and 2022, with a total of 1,500, uh, sorry, 155,841 offences. This was a 26% rise that nearly quadrupled from the 42,255 offences that were in 2012 to 2013 when the records had begun. No shock, considering the snitching cultures all over, you know, Great Western Railway or, or, or TFL saying, see it, say it, sorted, no place for hate, all this sort of nonsense. Um, racially motivated offences accounted for 70% 70, 70 of the crimes um the home office actually said that the report data 
Uh, they admitted, it is uncertain to what degree the increase in police recorded hate crime is a genuine rise, or due to the continued recording improvements and more victims having the con confidence to report these crimes to the police. So they, they could say, oh, it's just ideologically motivated, and because we're encouraging you to see hate everywhere. Well, let, let me tell you how, how this is. Let, let's just let's just say, yeah. you know, I'm outside and I see, I, I see you mm. get mugged by somebody. Yeah. Okay. And let's say that I perceive you as gay. Mm. That's it. I perceive you as gay. <laughs> Okay, so you you've not perceived yourself. You don't perceive yourself as gay. Sorry, lads, I don't. <laughs> All right, okay, you're not gay, yep. right? But I perceive I perceive you as gay. Yep. Right. What I need to do, all I need to do, is get hold of the police officer and say I perceive that as a homophobic yep. uh, theft, and it would be recorded as a hate crime. It's mental. <laughs> because the percep perception is everything. Yeah. Perception is everything, and the hate crime guidance specifically says the victim or any other person, if they perceive it to be so, it is so. Now, it gets even worse than this, because in the 2014 um, version of the hate crime guidance, it actually says that a decrease in hate crime should not be counted as a measure of success, mm. because it will demotivate officers. Well, in what kind of world... Does hate crime? Do you not see a decrease in hate crime as success? Yeah. Imagine, imagine having a murder squad, yeah. for instance, and they were told, "Oh, we don't want to see a decrease in murders yeah. because you know, we, or, or a robbery squad. We don't see a decrease in robberies." What what they've done? They've set themselves up a Ponzi scheme, mm. a hate industry Ponzi scheme. It's perverse and, incentives. Yeah, absolutely. And where where there's a Ponzi scheme, there is no actual no product. Mm. So you've just got to invent the product. Mm. And that's why they see hate everywhere. They are taught to see hate everywhere. They are like the religious fanatics who see Jesus in a slice of toast. Yep. These people are trained to see hate everywhere and to crank up the 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 hate statistics. Why? Because if they crank up the hate statistics, more money will be poured in to policing. Mm against the hate but what they're actually policing is ideology is, is people who are ideologically difficult the people like you people like me people like traditional traditional feminists mm. people who believe that sex is a, a thing yep everyday okay. conservatives yeah, yeah everyday conservatives so you create this illusion of hate and that then becomes the prompt for more resources, which then gives you even more hate, which then brings you even more resources, until eventually we just have to give up and go home. Yeah, I suppose you can just close. Seek, re seek refuge somewhere safe like Hungary. Yeah, yeah. I've I have checked the commute from Hungary to Swindon one too many times, I will say. I suppose you can just close with that by saying uh, there's, a, there's a hate demand which massively outstrips the supply. And so if you'd like to hear more from Harry specifically, we've got your sub stack here which you can subscribe to. We won't scroll down because there might be some um, verbotum facts for YouTube. And there's also the Bad Law Project on Twitter, which has been doing some fantastic work. Um, John, if you could just pop that on the screen, please. Thank you very much. And I really appreciate you helping me out with all of the absolute nonsense I was subjected to and look forward to seeing you help everyone else out in the future. It's always a pleasure. Thanks yeah. for having me. If you appreciated that segment from the podcast of the Lotus Eaters, you can go to lotuseaters.com to get access to all the premium content we have on the site, such as this premium article on the terminal list and the conversion of James Reese, with an audio track for silver and gold tiers, of course. If you'd like to go and find out what else we're putting out, you can follow us on Getter at lotuseaters underscore com on Getter. Thank you and goodbye.